Good afternoon. We have Mr. Paul McKenney here to give our next presentation. Please make Paul welcome. Thank you all. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what happens, or at least what's supposed to happen, when 4096 CPUs all do synchronized RSU expedited. And the idea is uh, to show kind of a snapshot of work to make this hopefully work well, and also hopefully to show some things that might be useful in your work. All right. So we're going to go through a few things. Uh, of course, it's important to figure out what should happen. And then we're going to look at an algorithm and a little bit of examples and some benchmarking and then see how we did. All right, so what should happen? And uh, um, perhaps more importantly, what should not happen? And one thing that shouldn't happen is this next slide. If we got 4,096 CPUs, um, if we have a grace period, each of the CPUs might need a quiescent state. 4,096 times 4,096 is about 16 million quiescent states. And if we actually make that happen, um, it's not going to be pretty, all right? We don't want that. Okay, well, that's all well and good, but what do we want instead, right? It's, it's all great to say that we don't want some disaster to happen, but the fact is we'd like something good to happen, and what is that good thing? We'll take a really quick look at what RCU's properties are here. Uh, there's a grace period, and this is a time, uh, you know, from some time to some other time, during which all CPUs, threads, or whatever, have passed through what we call a quiescent state. And uh, what that really means is if a reader is in progress when we start a grace period, that reader has to have finished before the grace period ends. And what that means is that when you do synchronize RCU expedited, you're saying, okay, look, if there are any readers out there, wait for them to finish, but hurry it up, as opposed to synchronize RCU, which does the same thing but takes a much more leisurely approach, and by the way, more efficient and more real-time friendly approach, and more energy efficient approach for that matter as well, uh, but is quite a bit slower. All right. And uh, what's a read side critical section? Well, you do RC read lock, you do a bunch of stuff, you do RC read unlock. And the idea is that you're going through there, and if somebody does synchronize RCU expedited, you have to get done before they get done. All right? So if they're going to make a change and then do something destructive, they have to wait till anybody who might have seen before that change gets done. The big thing is, is that it's independent of who requested it. All you need to happen is for everybody to have checked in, everybody to have gotten done. And it doesn't really make any difference who asked for everybody to get it done. You do the same thing. All right? And what that means is that a single grace period operation, a single row of those big ugly things on the previous slide, can serve all requests. So if you have a whole pile of requests, you can do one thing and take care of all of them. Um, in fact, if we look at the non-expedited grace periods, the normal synchronized RCU grace periods, it's, you can have a very normal workload. For example, if you unpack a tarball and then rm-rf it, you can end up with well over a thousand requests satisfied by a single grace period without trying hard. And that's really kind of nice because it means that each update is paying only a very small fraction of the price for that grace period. So let's look at this in pictorial form. So what we've got is the little blue boxes are readers. We have time advancing from left to right across the diagram. And uh, what we have on the bottom, those two bottom lines, we have a couple of tasks that are doing updates. So they do a change. And that change, for example, might be removing something from a linked list. Well, the way RCU works, the updaters don't block the readers. And so there might be a reader looking at that when we remove it. Well, that's OK. We've got the pointer to the rest of the list, and so the reader will progress through the list just fine. But we don't get to free the thing or otherwise stomp on it until the reader's done. We need the reader to get out of there before we do something destructive. And so that big yellow box is waiting for all the readers to get done. The thing is, we did that change, and there's a couple of readers who might be looking at that thing before we removed it. 
because they overlap with the change. And we have to wait for those to get done and go on to do something else and to let go of the reference of the thing we just removed before we can do those destructive two boxes on the lower right. But the thing to notice here is we have two processes, each of them do a change, and each of them wait, and eventually do something destructive in the green there, and a single grace period operation covers both of them. And we like that. That means we just do one thing and it serves everybody and life is wonderful. Uh, free is a good, very good price and cheap is not too bad either, right? Okay, so that's what we really like. We'd like all 4,096 of these guys to be serviced by one set of quiescent states, one grace period operation, and then just be done. Of course, um, what could happen is that the first couple CPUs could come in, get the grace period started, and then the rest of them show up, and they've shown up too late to take advantage of that earlier grace period. All right? So it's not too unusual to have something like this instead, where we have two. So the first few guys came in, they started one up, the other guys came too late to take advantage of the first one, so they start another one. That's still not too bad. That's two sets instead of 4,096 sets, which is a great improvement. But the key thing we want is we want to be able to take care of uh, advantage of this batching, to have one operation serve as many requesters as we possibly can. Again, what that means, we take the overhead of the operation divided by the number of requesters, the bigger the denominator, the happier we are. All right, uh, so that was one thing we don't want to happen. We don't want to have them all do, you know, go stomp on all the CPUs simultaneously and take forever to recover from that. Uh, what else don't we want to have happen? Uh, can somebody else tell me something else we don't want to have happen? Okay, that's a good one. He's jumping ahead of me, but that's a good one. Any others? The grace period go too long? Yeah, but if we're supposed to be expedited, so we don't want it to go too long. We'll talk about some of that a little bit later. Well, uh, one thing we don't want to have happen is we don't want to have like a single global lock, which is a variation on what Paul McCara said. Uh, we really don't want to have a single global lock that goes around all 4,096 processors and have them all be waiting on the lock for some huge amount of time, um, and again, taking forever. Okay, so what do we want instead? Well, we really want to have a number of locks so that each CPU can do something locally, get its job done, and keep going. Well, oh, there's some limitations of that because we're talking about something that's inherently a global operation. We have to wait for all the CPUs to get done with any read operations they had going on. So we have to kind of split the difference. And the way we do that is with the RCU node tree hierarchy here. So um, what we've got is we have a RCU state structure, and what that does is it represents a given flavor of RCU. There's global things about the RCU that are in there. And then there's a tree of these RCU node things. And uh, the first levels, the, the internal nodes, have a found out of 32 or 64, depending on the bitness of your machine. And the bottom level has a found out of 16. And then at the very bottom, in white there, we have per CPU structures, all right? And what that means is that we can have a, a separate lock, and we do have separate locks for all of those structures, and that means the CPUs can come in, grab their own lock, look around and see what happens. And in particular, if we're at the point where we're saying, all right, we need to find out, we, we need to wait for the readers, we need the readers to check in when they're done, a reader can go and look at his own structure and say, have I already checked in? Yes, I have, great, I can just leave without touching anything that's not private to that CPU. Well, if it hasn't checked in, it's going to have to go up and contend for the lock on the lowest RCU node structure, but only with, with 15 other CPUs. The other 4,000 some odd are dealing with other parts of the data structure. And the thing is that the odds are 15 out of 16 that'll look and say, okay, I've checked in, but there's somebody else still waiting, so I'm done, I leave. And only one sixteenth of the time is it going to go up to the next level. And once you get to the internal nodes, it's one out of 64 that it goes up to the next level. 
So even though we've got a single global lock at the very top, we filter the requests so the lock intention remains constant as we go up the tree. And the reason that happens is because we're winnowing out more and more CPUs on, at each level. Okay, so we're stuck having a single global lock because we have a global operation, but we structure the tree in such a way that we throw out the requests that aren't relevant. Only the last guy at a given level goes up to the next level and again, maintain constant low lock intention all the way up. All right, well that's, that's nice. Um, and uh, Paul beat us to the next slide, which is good. We don't want that happening either. Uh, if we have all of the CPUs beating up on a single cache line, there's 4,096 of them, that cache line shuttles around and, and your memory latency is really bad. You say, I want to mess with this cache line, you have to wait in line between 4,095 other CPUs. It takes a very long time and it's just not going to be pretty. We don't want that. And just like with locks, instead, we want to split things out. So we want different data. And guess what? You know that combining tree we talked about? That works well for this case, too. Because, again, you have replicate the fields out. Sorry about that. Uh, and we have separate instances. You look at your own data, and in many cases, you can say, I already checked in, I'm done. If you can't, again, the probabilities make it so that the lock intention is constant up the tree. So the global lock gets very little traffic. That way is the lock intention remains low. Okay, well, another important point is what don't we need from all of this? Well, I'm sorry if you felt otherwise, but you know, synchronized RCU expedited does not give you real-time response. Never has, probably not going to, and I'm not making it do it right now anyway. And the thing is, it's got to wait for the readers in any case. If some reader decides it wants to take a very long time, it's going to have to wait a very long time. So no real-time response. And another thing that means is that uh, if you benchmark this, there's going to be some variation in the timings. Because especially if you're running in a virtual machine, a given vCPU may be preempted, and we'll see that later. Uh, the other thing we're not promising is constant synchronized RCU expedited latency. If you add more CPUs, it's going to take longer to get done. It's going to be better than non-expedited primitives, because, but they also take longer. If you do a non-expedited primitive on a small machine, um, it'll take a few milliseconds. If you do it on a really big machine, it's more like 100 milliseconds. And uh, that is something that uh, heuristic we've developed that allows the machines to work reasonably. If you crank it down too far, they have all sorts of problems. And the other thing is we are not optimized solely for large system performance. If, uh, we, if making it work better on 4096 gives us a two for one penalty at the low end, sorry, we're not doing that. We'll take the hit at the high end if we have to. Okay, the overall algorithm, it turns out, is pretty simple. For every non-idle online CPU, we send an IPI. The IPI handler shows up in the CPU. It's able to look at the CPU's local state, and it's able to determine, is the CPU a reader right now with some degree of accuracy? And if it determines that, nope, the CPU is not a reader, we're all done here, then it goes and reports the quiescent state up the tree as far as it has to. If it turns out, yep, the CPU might be reading now, then what it has to do is set some local state so that when we get out of the read side critical section, we will go and report the quiescent state at that point. Okay? So this is fairly small overhead. However, it's still something the real-time guys aren't going to be really excited about. And the overall lesson is, please don't use synchronized RCU expedited unless you have a very good reason for it. Okay? Um, if you're running no hertz full, uh, user mode execution and no hertz full real-time, CPU bound real-time counts as idle. So that's still good, but the event-based real-time does take a bit of a hit from this. Not a huge hit, not as bad as it used to be, but some hit. Anyway, once all the non-idle online CPUs have said, yay, verily, I am, my readers are all done, then the grace period is complete, the guy requesting it is woken up, and we go out, get on with life. If I have the right button here. 
Of course, the trick is, you, that's one thing to do this, we want to do it without bottlenecks, or at least without bottlenecks that affect up to 4,096 CPUs. So here's kind of a way of approaching making concurrent stuff happen, kind of at the design level. And there'll be some variation. The way you use this uh, will depend on what you're doing. For example, in this case, we're not going to interact with hardware much aside from normal hardware. So we start by replicating and partitioning. In this case, mostly partitioning. If you can take your problem and divide it up nicely, and the combining tree is how we've approached that here, then it's just a lot easier to make things work. If it's all one big ball of mud, well, it's going to be difficult. Life's going to be hard. Once you've done that, and so we want to partition first, once you've done that, then you can work about taking the work associated with the data and breaking that up. In this case, we want to do the opposite. We want to combine it. We want a single grace period operation to serve a whole bunch of requests. So we want to use batching as a big optimization here. We want to have a whole batch of requests, do one grace period for them all, and then get to the next batch. Once you've done that, then you start worrying about uh, little details of what kind of locking or synchronization mechanism you use. A, a big mistake is for people to start over on the, right on the left hand side with the parallel access control. And if you haven't got your data and your work partitioned, that's going to make a big mess. And the problem with this especially is that this problem will use your own intelligence against you. The smarter you are, the bigger a hole you will dig for yourself before you realize you're in trouble. Okay, so you've been warned. Now, you're a bunch of smart people, so careful with the shovel. All right, so partitioning, we're going to use the RCU combining tree. And batching, we're going to make it have some kind of mechanism to efficiently piggyback off of work that somebody else is doing. If somebody's going to do this grace period, we want everybody else to very efficiently and quickly take advantage of it. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Well, for the weakening part, you know, uh, given who I am, you might guess that my advice would be use RCU. Um, but since we're implementing RCU, that's a little harder. Now, there have been some implementations of RCU that have kind of nested RCU in some sense, but this is not one of those cases. So um, we're not going to worry about weakening the much here. And hardware, this has to be portable. So, sorry, at this point, no FPGAs or GPGPUs. Perhaps at some later date, we'll have GPGPUs and FPGAs just inside of all commodity microprocessors, sort of like vector units have gotten there, or in floating point before that, and interrupt controllers before that, and Lord knows what else back in the past. But uh, right now, um, nothing really happening there. Uh, if you are using these things, you may need to start with the hardware. If you're using a GP, GPU, the properties of the hardware may drive the rest of your design. Okay, so we're doing the top two. We're partitioning and we're batching. Okay, so again, we get this diagram one more time for you. It'll actually show up again. We're going to have a mutex at each level, at the per CPU level and up the, up the RCU node tree. And the idea is that as you go up, you acquire that mutex. The guy who gets to the top is going to actually do the grace period. When he releases his lock, people will filter up and notice that it's changed. And we'll, we'll, there'll be more detail on this on the next slides. Um, and of course, we've got this bottleneck at the RC, root RCU node structure. If everybody just keeps going up, without, in, for this to work, we have to have people leave the tree part way up. If we just have everybody go to the top and grab to the root node, we, all we've done is slowed down, you know, taken a global bottleneck and made it even slower. So we have to have people leave part way up for this to work. And that's where our batching comes in. We're going to do that. We're going to make them leave part way up. All right, so let's look at how we can make this happen. So we've got time again going from left to right. And we have the blue boxes are expedited grace periods. We have A, B, C, and A, B, C, and B again. That should be D. And the thing is, you have to show up before the grace period starts before you can take advantage of it. So the guys in the first green box there, if they show up during that time, before that grace period starts, before grace period, grace period A starts, as soon as grace period A finishes, they're done, whether they're the ones that actually made it happen or not. 
If they show up later than that, in that second green box, well, even if they show up right near the beginning of grace period A, they can't use it because it's already started. Some CPU may have already gone through its quiescent state, and that spoiled it for us. So the guys in the, from the start of grace period A to the start of grace period B have to wait for grace period B. All right? You have to wait for a full grace period. So if you're in the middle of one, you have to wait for that one to finish. Then you have to wait for the next one to finish. All right. And, and so on through the rest of them. And so we just need a way of organizing that process. And one way to organize it is to number things. So we're not going to number the grace periods, we're going to number phases. So zero is before there's a grace period at all. Even numbers mean there's no grace period in progress. Odd numbers are a particular grace period. So if you show up during the zero time or before, as soon as the counter hits two, you're done. If you show up during one and two, you have to wait for the counter to get to four. And uh, two and three has to wait, or excuse me, um, three and four has to wait for six. And so on up the, up the round. All right? So we can, by doing this, by numbering the grace periods and the intervals between them, we can take a snapshot of a number, and then once the number reaches a certain value beyond that point, we know that somebody's already done our work for us and we can just leave. So the next slide will summarize the numbers. So that's just saying what I said, but having a list. And the general rule is at the bottom. You take the starting number, you add three to it, you clear the bottom bit, and that's the number you have to wait for. All right? So that's pretty straightforward, and that's all we really have to do. And this is what the trick we're going to use to get the people out of that tree so that most of them don't have to go to the root. So what we're going to do is we're going to snapshot the, a sequence number, and this is that thing that went zero before a grace period, one's the first grace period, two's between, and, th and uh, three's the next one. And we're going to add three and clear the low, low, lower order bit. We're going to go and try to find a great, we're going to try to start a grace period. But as we go up the tree and acquire locks and release the ones behind us, if we see the number has gone far enough, we say, great, somebody did our work for us, we're out of here. And that's how we're leaving the tree and making sure that very few people go to the top. That global lock is almost uncontended as a result. Okay, and then if we're the guy that gets to the top and nobody's done our work for us, we're out of luck, we have to do work ourselves. Sometimes that happens, you know, it's, uh, that's life. So what we're going to do is we're going to increment that number. So if it was zero, now it's one. We're going to start the grace period, we're going to wait for the grace period to end, like we showed, saw on a few slides ago. And then once that happens, we increment the number again. At that point, we know we're done. And hopefully, a whole bunch of people at various points in the tree acquiring, trying to acquire locks are suddenly done as well. And we're going to show this animated a little bit, so you'll, we'll get another shot at it. Uh, plus, we're going to show a diagram of how this would work. So a CPU kind of goes up the tree. At the very bottom, it says, OK, I'm going to snapshot this number. I'm going to grab the current number, and I'm going to remember it. I'm going to add three to it, clear the bottom bit, and remember that number. And then I'm going to acquire my own lock on my CPU's data structure at the bottom, the white one. And once I've acquired the lock, I'm going to check the number. If the number's advanced as far as I need it, I say, great, I release that lock, I'm out of here, I'm done. And we go up, if, if that's not the case, we're holding the lock for our CPU structure, we go and acquire the lock for the leaf RC node structure, and we check again. At this point, we're holding both those locks, and if the number has advanced far enough, we release the locks we have and we keep going. And we go up the tree, acquiring a lock and releasing the one behind us, acquire the next one, release the one behind us. So we're holding two locks momentarily, and, but for most of the time, just to try to acquire one and holding the one behind us. And the theory is, the only reason we're moving up the tree is because the guy at the very top is releasing a lock. Every time the guy at the top has released the lock, we've had another expedited grace period complete. And in theory, a whole bunch of people inside the tree at that point, once they acquire the next lock up, should realize, wait, my grace period's over, I'm done, and be able to exit the tree. So the idea is, instead of having a big winnowing thing, a big traffic jam, the load on the tree should suddenly evaporate 
once a grace period completes. And again, and we're going to go through an animation of this to get a better look at it. Okay, one optimization we could do, though, I mean, this is kind of a pain. If you have uh, on a system that's where, where there aren't expedited grace periods happening very often, which is the common case, by the way. And so one thing you do, I mean, if you do that, what you do is you're going up this stupid tree for no good reason because there's nobody else there. And there's nobody else doing the grace period, so every time you check, well, you still have to do the work, so you've added all these extra locks. Had a bunch of extra cache misses, what are you doing, right? So one thing you could do is, at the first, you could say, all right, is the lock at the very top free? If it is, try to acquire it. If you acquire it, say, okay, I'm here, do my grace period and get out, and that way you get rid of that extra latency of running up the tree when, the, when there's very low traffic. And so we'll look at that as well. Excuse me? Uh, the cache line bounce? Uh, yes, so the question was, doesn't that make the cache line bounce when you do that? It does, um, and so you'll end up with some extra traffic on the lock. Uh, what will happen is that they will read it, and uh, if it is, if it is uh, not held, uh, but that's the same thing that people trying to acquire it are doing, um, and if it is not held, only then will they actually go and, get a, and invalidate everybody. So yes, there is some extra overhead there. Um, so a good question. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. So what we're doing here is we're kind of making a tree, a fairly small one. The bottom layer is the RCU data, the per CPU things, the bottom empty boxes. And the very bottom one, the ones that are red now, are a bunch of tasks, A, B, C, and D, who are now snapshotting the grace period. At the very top, we've got the grace period number, which is zero. Zero plus three is three. Clear the bottom bit, you get two. So these guys say, okay, I'm waiting for the grace period number to get to two. And the colors are shown on the edge there. Red means they're not done yet. Yellow means they're done, but they don't know it yet because they're trying to acquire a lock, so they haven't had a chance to look. And blue at the bottom says they've, they've, they know that they're done. Okay, and at that point, they can actually exit the tree. All right, so these guys have come in, they've snapshot the lock, and we're assuming there's just piles and piles of tasks that are all wanting to do a grace period. Everyone wants to do a grace period, and so there's an infinite supply of tasks that want to do this. And that means the next step, what happens, is these guys all try to lock their own RCU data, like that, and the arrows show where somebody's advanced, and a whole other set of tasks, E, F, G, and H, have just shown up and done another snapshot. Well, the number hasn't changed, so they get the same number. All of these guys are going to be taken care of as soon as the grace period number hits two. Okay, the next step is that the top two pairs are going to contend for the next level up of the RCU node, the leaf RCU node lock. So A and B are going to go after that one box on the left, and C and D are going to go for the box on the right. And let's assume that uh, A and C win, and we'll end up with that. And at that point, I and J have popped up because, again, we've got an infinite number of tasks all wanting to do grace periods, so we'll have a, always have a good supply. And B and D are stuck. They're down at the bottom level. They're still waiting for their locks. So we've gone up to the next level. We've got A and C now are going to contend for the root lock. Let's say that A wins. It does, and B moves up. Uh, F and K come in. F moves up and K comes in at the bottom. Again, now at this point, a, when it got the lock, started a grace period. Notice that the grace period number, instead of being zero, is now one. Okay, because it started the grace period. And that means the new tasks can't use this grace period, because it's already started. They have to wait for a full grace period, start to end. And therefore, K at the bottom there, he has four. Because one plus three is four. Clear the bottom bit, it's still four. So K is going to have to wait for the next grace period. Everybody else, as soon as A gets done with the grace period, they're covered. But K has to wait for another one. All right. So the next thing that's going to happen is A is going to get done with the grace period, like that. And because A was the one doing the grace period, it knows it's done, so it's blue. Everybody else, they're done, but they don't know it yet because they're still trying to get the lock for the next guy up. All right. But at this point, you can see we've got, um, what, uh, 10 tasks that are all taken care of by this one grace period. And so we should see them just kind of evaporate and leave and not contend, for the most part, not contend for the upper lock. But first, A is going to release the lock. 
When it does that, this happens. Let's say that C wins, so it moved up. D moved up, H moved up, we've got L now. L has to wait for 4. 2 plus 3 is 5. Clear the bottom bit, you get 4. At this point, C, D, and H all know they're done. So they're going to just leave. They're going to try to acquire more locks. They're just going to get it out. And at that point, we'll have something looking like this. B wants a lock. E and I come up. Uh, M and O are new here. And so at this point, we've gotten three uh, sets of people coming up. And the next time, all five of those guys are going to disappear because they realize their grace bins take care of. There's no point in getting more locks. There's a release and leave. And we'll end up with that happening. So the last guy looking for the end of grace period 2, F finally gets his lock, realizes he's done. And everybody else is looking for grace period 4 now. F is not going to try to get the root lock because it's leaving. And that means L is the only one contending for it. And so it's going to move up. Because F left, then K and Q move up, and we get T. Now, as soon as L moves up there, he increments the grace period number. It used to be 2, now it's 3. And that means that T and U in the bottom that just showed up as a result of this, they need 6. 3 plus 3 is 6. Clear the bottom bit, you still have 6. But everybody else in the tree is going to be satisfied when the grace period number gets to 4. And uh, once that happens, we end up with this situation. And uh, at this point, we have one more. When we get this grace period done, we've got nine requests covered by the grace period. So we're getting a good multiplier here on a fairly small system. We have a way of batching things so that a, so that a single grace period completion covers a large number of requests. Now, you notice it took a few cycles for people to realize their grace period was done. But that duration is, uh, is a function of the height of the tree. The highest possible tree in RCU is four levels, five if you count the per CPU level. So in a fairly no small number of, of uh, operations, which are highly parallel, everybody's gone. Uh, perhaps we can do better than that. That's something I'll be looking at in the future. But this works not too badly. OK. That's wonderful. Uh, we get great performance and scalability, in theory. Yes? Tell me when. Yep. Um, it is possible that L gets the lock instead of. Uh, so what had to happen for this? Let's go. Let's go further up. Uh, so F is down here. And I assume, if we go down, we'll see that I assumed that, so we have F and I are competing for that lock. And the thing is that I already knows that it's done. So if it gets the lock, it's going to immediately release it, right? I mean, let me try that again. Let's go back even further. I was down here, and it knew that it, um, that it was, it did not know it was done because it hadn't acquired the lock. So let's watch I, and we got F, the F and I were worried about. I gets the lock next up. It's the only one contending for it. And it knows it's done. It's not going to go for the lock next up. It's going to leave. So the only task contending for that lock currently held by E is F. And therefore, next time around, I, E, and B, and J, and, and G are all going to disappear, which they do. And F is the only one going for that lock, so it gets it. But you're right. You can imagine some kind of an interesting thing happening where locks got granted in funny orders and people got stuck for a while. Okay. And um, fixing that would be a good thing. If, if, you have, if you have fair locks, then maybe things will work better and uh, you're right on, the, right on things here. <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, the thing is, is that theory is wonderful, but uh, uh, the only difference between theory and practice is that in theory, they're both the same. <laughs> Uh, so let's do some benchmarking. And uh, after all, how hard can it be? <laughs> yeah, you've watched some of the talks earlier this, in this uh, session, haven't you? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, this is pretty straightforward, though. You just have a tight loop around synchronized get expedited in one set of threads and one and the read side critical selection of other ones to give some kind of load, right? Shouldn't be too hard. Um, except that if you do that, you get really horrible latencies, hundreds of milliseconds, sometimes seconds. 
And part of what's happening is that if you have your kernel built with certain parameters, the tight loop with reset critical sections isn't letting RCU proceed, and so it's having to wait for until somebody decides to schedule this on top of it, do a time slice interrupt. So we need to put a con resket RCU QS in the middle of that. And if we do that, um, things get a little bit better, but they still are pretty bad. Uh, and then one thing that I realized was I forgot a quiescent state. When you send the IPI, it interrupts from idle. That's quiescent, but it was saying, oh, I'm not quiescent right now. Well, yeah, you were when you, like you will when you go back. And so uh, that takes care of that, uh, that thing. And by the way, the reason we get away with that is that we sent the interrupt before we got the interrupt, and so there was some time we're idle between the two. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's still painful. It's uh, doing all right. Uh, now, the usual thing is you pin things to CPUs, and that helped a little bit. And I'm not going to go through great detail. There was a bunch of stupid mistakes I made benchmarking, I guess is the best way to summarize this. And uh, I make them almost every time, and I made them again. I'm consistent. Uh, if you look at the slides that later will be available, you can see some of them. Uh, and uh, hopefully avoid them yourself, although doing them myself does not seem to help me avoid them in the future. Uh, one key thing was doing it using ftrace. And uh, that got rid of some of the problems with print k that I was using otherwise. And that also meant that I'd look at the ftrace data and see where things were getting bottled up. And what was happening, and uh, this is something that I think Ben asked a little bit earlier, so, you know, good catch. Uh, if we go back to the original thing, we got L up there. And L's going to release that lock, right? And the lock is released. We have this optimization where you check the top of the tree first, right? <laughs> Guess what? V shows up. It's got the lock. It's a new gray spread. Except that there's all these guys down there that are already done, but they can't do anything about it because they haven't got their lock. And so they're still blocked, and they can't go look at the thing to see that they're done. And that's not good. That gives us uh, some pretty horrible latencies. All right. So uh, what we do is we eliminate that optimization, that uh, so-called optimization. Uh, this helped a little bit. Um, and I looked at ftrace again and then found out that even with that optimization limited, eliminated, as Ben might have uh, thought given his question, people could still jump ahead of the queue. And the way that can happen is as follows. So V is there. He's uh, doing his thing. He gets done. He releases the lock, and these guys move up. And let's say that there wasn't anybody there. I mean, I've been assuming there's an infinite number of tasks, but let's say that at this point things are kind of quieting down. There's nobody there to replace you. And they all disappear. And then V shows up. He needs grace period 8. Now these guys are going to wake up and get their locks, except that it takes a long time for them to wake up. In that time, it's no problem at all for V to go popping up here and get to the top and have the lock again and make these guys wait again. And looking at the F-trace data, this was happening a lot. So no, these are sleep locks. Uh, because I have to wait for a grace period while doing them. So I, if I use a spin lock, I'm in deep yogurt. <laughs> Maybe deep something else. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, though, and this is, this is to Ben's question finally. Uh, one way to take care of this is to use RT mutex. And uh, you can't mainline RT mutex in common code, but hey, this is a, an experiment, so let's try it. And the, the attribute of RT mutex we want is that it's FIFO within priority groups, all right? And at that point, that means that it will take the extra pain of waiting for the guy to wake up and get the lock and not let this guy just came popped up there and get it immediately have it yet. And once we did that, things got a lot better. Instead of having almost no batching benefit, I mean, we started off like 1.01 or something like that. It was horrible. And now we're getting up to where we're getting 6x batching. So in other words, each grace period is taking care of six people, and that's actually, you know, something reasonable. But we're getting 4.7 millisecond worst case, which isn't exactly accidentated for this kind of workload, although it's better than a second like we're getting before. Anyway, part of the problem was we were running at boot time. I use automation, I fire off a VM, I start it up, and it's not booted yet. And so you, boot time is just not the best time for clean uh, access to CPUs. And so delaying it made it so that we weren't getting all that noise, and that quieted things down quite a bit. Uh, another problem was I was running ftrace dump. I forgot to pull out of real-time priority, and uh, it did ftrace dump at real-time priority and messed up everybody else that was still waiting for a grace period. 
Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, we're getting towards the end. But in, in the, the question is, see, the thing is, um, I have a confession to make. You see, I actually don't have a machine with 4,096 CPUs. And uh, fortunately, I have relevant experience. <laughs> see, I come from a day where you could take a bunch of stuff and hand it into some operators, and you might be a few minutes or a few hours or a few days before you got it back. And so you had to be able to think about what the machine was doing and, you know, do stuff. Uh, so one dirty trick is to note that this thing blocks and I can have a lot more threads than I have CPUs and at least get some approximation. It's not perfect. And, uh, um, but when I did 26 tasks on 20, 32 CPUs, things got horrible. And the problem was that uh, all the tasks were running real time and I want to make sure that they stay there until the end, until everybody's done, because I want the load to be constant. But the scheduler doesn't know one task from another, so it'll go ahead and run one guy that's already done, already got as many measures as it needs. And so the solution is to put the guys out of real time as soon as they get the right number of measurements, so the scheduler has, knows which ones it's supposed to run and which ones it shouldn't really care about as much. And that uh, got things down to something reasonable. And we ended up with this, which is not bad at all. We got uh, minimums of a uh, handful of microseconds, 90th percentile is a couple hundred, which isn't great, but this is not real time, and the mean is down in a few tens. That's not bad. Um, maximum's kind of ugly, but you know, this, again, this is not real time. It's okay to have big maximums for this prim primitive, and we're getting great batching. I mean, we're getting, in one case, over 100. And by the way, you'll notice that the higher the mean, the higher the batching in this case. That's not an accident. The longer it takes, the more time people have to come up and jump into the next one. Anyway, I'm getting towards the end of the time here. I'm going to, so another trick is to do a full-sized um, tree. I was using a shorter one. And that showed more problems. In fact, they were so horrible, I ran twice as many because like, this is real? Yeah, it is. And the uh, problem is I've got more interactions. I haven't debugged this yet. Um, I just came across it yesterday. I will. But the thing is, is it really the taller tree or the fact I'm running 54 CPUs instead of 32? Well, okay, run 54 with a smaller tree. And yes, it is the tree seems to be what's causing it, although maybe there's a surprise in there somewhere. But I still have something to do, and this is the next thing to take on. Anyway, a longer-term fix is to do data reduction in the kernel, because I think that's part of what's causing the problem. Getting, doing all the print Ks or all of the F traces is putting a big wham on the system and making it take a long time. If I do data reduction in the kernel, I can reduce that. And uh, at some point, though, I'm not going to have a choice. Uh, well, I don't have a choice. Somebody's going to run on 4,096 CPUs. If it doesn't work well, they'll yell at me. And then I'll know whether I've managed to. But at least I'll clear out some of the problems. I've done several fixes as part of this effort. And those bugs won't be there when these guys show up. They'll have to find new ones. <laughs> they probably will. They have in the past. I mean, you know. And uh, that means that uh, going forward, as I continue this, I'll need to use more dirty tricks to try to emulate 4096 processor on a much smaller system. So, uh, lessons learned. Uh, we already knew the top one. Benchmarking is not as easy as it looks. Uh, obvious optimizations aren't always. Uh, I think I can recover that optimization, by the way, but um, I'm, uh, it'll require some more thought. Uh, order is important in this particular case. It isn't always, but it sure is this time. Uh, the nice thing is, by even though I don't have 4,096 CPUs, I was able to find and fix some bugs that would have killed me at that level, and that's a good thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, until I have 4,096 CPUs, there's still probably bugs, but at least I've gotten rid of some of them. With that, uh, IBM legal slide there. And uh, if we have more questions, I'd be happy to take them. We've got time for at least one or two more, I think. We can take a couple of questions quickly. I heard something about CPUs easily. Oh, yeah. Uh, what happens is the tree is set up for all the CPUs that could be there. And so there's a spot for the CPU to pop in when the hot plug happens. So yeah, uh, that, <laughs> that's a fun one too. <laughs> one more.
there are other users, they might be sleeping, I won't jump the queue. Okay, so the question was, instead of doing ordering and other tricks like that to prevent queue jumping, could you make the, the responsibility of the guy that's thinking about jumping the queue to check and see how many people are in the queue? and just to use some self-restraint and not jump the queue if there are people he'd be jumping ahead of. You could do that, but that would mean I'd have to look at the whole tree. No, and no, as someone say enters the tree, yeah. um, just increment something. Right. Um, uh, remember, that, remember that slide where I had all the, all the CPUs beating on that one variable? Ah. <laughs> but so yeah, it, um, uh, but that's an interesting problem I have to solve is some way, I'd like to make it so that if there's nothing going on, the guy just goes to the top and gets going. That, that's what I want to do. But <laughs> doing it efficiently and making it work is uh, going to be a little bit of a challenge, but hey, you know, that's fun. This is for, for me anyway. We, one more? Or? Mm -hmm. You mean like that? Uh, well, he was saying, what he, what he was saying, I'm sorry, uh, is, uh, is that you check the locks all the way up and you have a clear path and go, and that's okay except that you got the rest of the tree that might be there. Yeah, but how often do you end up in that scenario? Um, of course, you have trace more often than I would have thought possible. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have agreed, you know, a week ago I would have agreed with you, no problem at all, but the machine thought differently. Paul, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. On behalf of LCA, please accept a small... Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>